morning, or I guess it's almost uh, lunch. Hopefully uh, people will stick around. Um, it's really a pleasure to be part of this meeting. I'm very pleased uh, that Autism Speaks uh, is focusing on aging uh, and excited about the possibilities. Um, uh, this is a huge topic. It cuts across many perspectives and disciplines. Um, I believe that uh, Autism Speaks turning their attention to this has enormous potential to raise the visibility of this very important area of work. Um, I'm gonna focus my talk uh, on the topic of autism in older age and speak more broadly about cross-cutting issues that I think we should be thinking about uh, that will impact research, uh, clinical care and training. Um, and just one sort of caveat uh, disclaimer, um, I'm gonna, you know, I was trying to figure out who was attending the meeting and I'm looking at the participant list and not sure I, I judged this accurately. I'm going to speak as a, as a researcher, as a scientist, as a clinician, and I'm uh, trying to match the audience, but, but I have to say that um, that's hard to do. And, and this talk is, is really pitched mostly at um, clinicians and, and, uh, and scientists. So this may seem like an odd place to begin this talk. Uh, this is the uh, soon to be released sixth issue, uh, cover of the sixth issue of the uh, APA textbook of uh, geriatric psychiatry. Um, the first edition was published in 1989, um, a few years after I started my clinical training. Uh, I remember my first psychiatry rotation on the uh, brand new inpatient geriatric psychiatry unit at Johns Hopkins, um, thinking that I really wasn't sure what geriatric psychiatry even was. Uh, and uh, what my main thought was, I didn't really know that it was a, a thing. Um, and in those days, quite frankly, it wasn't. Uh, it was just beginning. But now, you know, 30 to 40 years later, uh, geriatric psychiatry is a huge field. And it embodies a comprehensive knowledge base that I like to say goes from cells to services, that guides research, clinical practice, training, uh, and policy with major programs in every university in this country. So I begin this meeting uh, by issuing uh, what hopefully is a provocative challenge to all of us. Um, first, that we don't underestimate the depth, breadth, and importance of this area. Uh, We've begun to study it. Uh, we have wonderful research that has led, uh, been led by uh, just a few folks, uh, Hilda Gertz in the Netherlands, Marsha Malik in Wisconsin, who are part of this um, uh, conference, a more recent edition uh, of a tremendous program of research in the UK that Jeremy Parr is gonna tell us about and, and exciting new research uh, showcased in the recent uh, NIH workshop that includes uh, several young investigators at Drexel and Arizona State um, and other places. Um, but my second point, my sense is that we really only just scratched the surface. Uh, this is a daunting task with some unique methodologic issues, um, some of which I'm gonna to touch on in this talk. Um, but it's my, my main hope that uh, far sooner than 40 years uh, from now, our collective efforts will produce enough foundational knowledge to fill the pages of a comprehensive textbook uh, on older age and autism. Whoops, that's not very good. Okay, somehow or another that first slide didn't come out. So I'm gonna to skip to this other one. You have to imagine that uh, there's a slide underneath this. Um, but I wanted to just speak to this mixed audience and begin with a bit of an historical perspective. Um, in the early days, um, the focus uh, for many years uh, was a focus on infantile autism uh, with symptoms first noted uh, in infancy. And uh, you can't really see the text here, but in the first paper by Leo Connor, um, he describes uh, Donald T, um, who could hum and sing many tunes accurately, and there's a little more text there to see, but in infancy. Uh, but then those children grew up, and we began talking about childhood autism. Uh, this book by Lorna Wing as late as 1998 uh, on children, on autistic children. 
Um, and then perhaps um, being led by, uh, well, uh, and, and then I, I, I would say maybe around 15 years ago, my recollection that we began to talk about this important transition into adulthood and that there were in fact adults with autism. Uh, and then finally, maybe coming full circle to Donald T with this paper in the Atlantic in 2010, um, they basically signaled that um, autism really uh, is, is an issue across the lifespan and we need to think about older adults uh, with autism. So around the same time as uh, this uh, Atlantic paper came out, I organized a two-day meeting in Chapel Hill with 30 experts uh, with the goal of writing a white paper to outline a research agenda for autism in older adults. And uh, these two folks highlighted here in yellow, Kathy Lord and Tamar Heller, attended that, uh, that meeting. Uh, and I want to point out a few things uh, about the meeting that I think are important for the field to consider. The first is that we involved 15 autism experts, uh, but we also invited 15 experts in geriatrics, most of whom had no background in autism, although a few had expertise in aging and intellectual disability. Uh, the field of autism has been and certainly was then largely child focused with the majority of researchers trained in specialties involving children. Uh, just as an aside, uh, when we put this meeting together, we invited the National Institute of Aging and the, the response was that we, we don't focus on autism, we, we focus on aging. And clearly that's uh, begun to change and is a, is a welcome change to see. Uh, the second thing to notice, um, oh, and I should add that um, that um, we also had in attendance at that meeting, uh, um, Lisa Gelati, who I see is at, 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 in attendance now, and Jovier Evans, who uh, heads the uh, geriatrics uh, program at NIMH. Um, and the second uh, thing I wanna know, uh, point out is the breadth of the attendees. Uh, we had clinicians, uh, we had uh, internal medicine clinicians and psychiatrists and neurologists. We had policymakers, experts in long-term care, basic scientists, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, representatives from NIH, um, because this is really a very big topic that requires all of these perspectives and more. Okay. So what is older age and autism? Uh, this meeting is about autism and aging and I'm focusing on older age, but it really isn't entirely clear what older age and autism actually is. Um, most of us probably think about aging uh, when we think of our grandparents, uh, we think about that's sort of older age. Um, I'm 67 and my grandparents and frankly, most in their generation looked and seemed noticeably older than my contemporaries. Uh, they didn't go to the gym, they didn't watch their diets, they weren't working. Um, you can go on social security now at 62, you can get your AARP card at 50. Um, I think the short answer is that people clearly age at different rates. But the longer and perhaps more important answer is that how this goes is really strongly determined by psychosocial and, and economic environment, uh, the burden of mental and physical health problems and stress. Um, it's my contention that for those with a developmental disability, we should not assume to know what older age actually is. And I think that we need to begin to understand the impact of these factors on their uh, development in later life. But while it isn't entirely clear where older age begins, what is clear is that in order to study it, we need to think about the run-up to older age that will inform us about predictors and patterns uh, leading to this period. And even more importantly, it will provide us with insight into change over time. Maybe this is a little technical. Uh, this is work that I've been involved with. And so I just use it as an example to show um, that we're used to thinking about change in autism because of the rapid changes that we see across childhood 
uh, where the field has clearly demonstrated age specific changes in autism and brain on the right and behavior on the left and in childhood. Um, on the left is a study showing uh, age specific changes in cognitive level and in infants at increased likelihood for autism who later develop autism. Um, and on the right, uh, is the example of measuring this uh, brain metric uh, fractional anisotropy at six months, 12 months, and, and, and 24 months, uh, with the point being that it really demonstrates that autism is the quintessential developmental disorder. And that means that there are age-specific changes over time. If you look at six months of age, you're going to find something different than if you look at 24 months of age. But change is much slower in adults, and that adds to the challenge of how we study it. Uh, using uh, this uh, accelerated linear design on the left, Janet Lanehart's group demonstrated uh, age-specific changes in the brain and autism that extended into adulthood. On the right, Marsha Malik, who's uh, also attending this meeting, um, observed age-specific changes across adulthood in activities of daily living. Um, but while these early studies are suggestive of age-specific changes in autism, it's less clear uh, whether the age-specific changes we see earlier in life are happening in autism throughout adult life, and which changes are specific to aging in autism and which are not. But what is clear uh, is that we are... Um, studying aging in a very diverse, etiologically heterogeneous group uh, that have a developmental condition uh, like autism and that cross-sectional studies adjusting for age are unlikely to tell us all of what we need to know. Uh, this is particularly, uh, I think, clear when it comes to something like cognition, um, where intellectual disability is common in autistic individuals. And in order to really study it properly, uh, we need to look at change in the same individuals over time uh, to see uh, if their cognitive abilities decline in relationship to their baseline. Um, of course, this is a problem in our uh, research world of funding through NIH, as grants are typically uh, uh, for five years, and most of our long-term studies are probably in place uh, accidentally because people just end up getting funded uh, um, for multiple cycles. Uh, but I think what, what we need is to do something like is being completed now in adolescence with a prospective study called the ABCD study of uh, a huge group of children seen adolescents seen uh, serially and prospectively. And what we need is a prospective study uh, from middle age through older adulthood uh, to really understand uh, what is happening in this age group. Now, I'm going to talk about another methodologic challenge that we face in studying older autistic uh, individuals, um, and that is how, how we find or ascertain our samples. So David Mandel screened patients for autism uh, in a state hospital, state psychiatric hospital in Pennsylvania, and he discovered that 10% of them were misdiagnosed, mostly with schizophrenia, and in fact had autism. And apart from the tragedy of that at an individual level, this has important implications for our research. Uh, to study people over 50 means that we have to look back to folks born uh, before 1970 uh, when the clinical world was using DSM-2, uh, it was intermingling autism and schizophrenia. At the time, we reported that the, we were uh, thinking that the prevalence of autism was four in 10,000. And if you assume, as I do, that the prevalence is probably the same, um, uh, uh, was probably the same then as it is now, then there are an enormous number of adults with autism who we have yet to identify. Uh, and this has huge implications uh, for our study. Just briefly, I, I got involved with this about 10 years ago in North Carolina, uh, trying to find uh, subjects for a, a small grant that we had, and we were looking for subjects over 60 with a childhood diagnosis. Remarkably, we ended up with 20 subjects. Um, seems kind of surprising. Um, and needless to say, we had major difficulties finding them. Um, and. Uh, 
the point being that the ones that we ended up with are no doubt more severely affected and not representative of the population of older autistic adults. You know, we, we did a lot of things to try and find uh, these subjects. Um, one was to look at the medical record in the, uh, our large uh, university uh, hospital that um, uh, treats people all over the state. And we looked for uh, people over uh, 60. And, and one of the very interesting findings was that we found people over 80. I found 13 people with a diagnosis in the medical record over 80 who had a diagnosis of autism. But then when we scratched the surface, we found uh, that they also had a diagnosis of dementia, which seemed really surprising and interesting. Um, but when we looked a little further, we found that not only did they all have a diagnosis of something very specific called frontotemporal dementia, which is associated with late life social behavioral changes that mimic some aspects of autism, but that they clearly did not have autism um, at uh, younger uh, ages. Um, so I, I think we have a huge challenge in how we go about designing these studies. Um, we have uh, issues with how we diagnose uh, in uh, adulthood and older age. Uh, what are their diagnostic criteria? Do we use the same, what are essentially childhood cri uh, criteria derived from childhood? Um, our assessment tools are often child focused. Um, diagnosis currently requires early history. And what do we know about the cross-sectional diagnosis in older adults? How do we think about comparing these different diagnostic schemes? Um, what is the effect of gender that was mentioned uh, in the panel? Um, I'm just briefly going to mention one uh, example that I'm most familiar with. Uh, and that's um, Parkinson's disease. Um, my uh, group published this paper a few years ago. Uh, we, were, we had a struggle trying to figure out where to start with older uh, age and autism because we could have gone in any direction. And what we wanted to do was focus on something very medical in order to get traction and hopefully influence the field because people pay attention to things like Parkinson's disease. And, and so we did this study and we had two samples, one in North Carolina and one in Australia. We found uh, elevated rates of Parkinson's disease on direct assessment. Uh, we, did, we didn't have a comparison group, but the rates that we found were 200 times uh, the rate in the general population. And uh, the same year, Lisa Crowen, who's an epidemiologist who was studying a, a, a sample uh, in medical records uh, from Kaiser Permanente, a very large sample, uh, found uh, similarly elevated rates of Parkinson's disease. And just recently, um, Gertz, Hilda Gertz and, and um, Greg Wallace uh, have done this also sort of cross-national study uh, of self-report that uh, is finding uh, converging evidence of this uh, same problem. So, you know, with that, we, we, we have some uh, replication. We think maybe this is a real thing that we're finding increased rates of Parkinson's disease. And I just wanted to dig in for a moment um, at a more granular level, um, because it's not just this sort of concept of Parkinson's disease. It's really, how does this, uh, that it's increased in, in people and uh, in, in autistic uh, uh, people, but it's uh, how, at, in a, on a day-to-day -day level, how does something like this interact with, uh, with the person? So I have a couple of vignettes from a colleague of mine, Sergio Starkstein from his clinic. Um, the first one is an autistic man who had an active independent life, but was noted to get upset with change in his routine or his environment. Uh, his routine included getting coffee in the morning at a local restaurant. But with the onset of his Parkinson's disease, his severe tremor resulted in his being unable to drink his coffee without spilling it, leading to behavioral outbursts, ultimately resulting in disruption in his schedule uh, and uh, diminished level of function. A lower functioning uh, autistic man who lived in a group home 
had always been able to feed and dress himself. But again, with onset of severe tremor, uh, he became fully dependent on care by others, leading to chronic irritability, frustration, um, behavioral upsets that required frequent uh, interactions with his uh, care team. And finally, an autistic woman who had a particular form of Parkinson's disease, who developed poor balance, uh, frequent falling and a shuffling gait. Um, as a result of an exaggerated fear of falling, she became reclusive, developed agoraphobia and panic attacks. Her level of functioning diminished uh, and she was misdiagnosed by a local physician as having a late onset psychosis. Uh, but on reevaluation, she was later, later treated with a, an anti-anxiety medication and she was able to return to her baseline. Now, I think I use this uh, as an example, but this is going to, I think, be a story that's played out in a lot of different ways um, with a lot of other comorbidities and particularly those associated with aging. We heard from the panel concerns about um, sensory uh, issues. Um, loss of hearing and vision are common with aging, and we really have no idea how these will interact with autism. Um, and um, we also know that in the non-autistic population, hearing and vision changes are associated with uh, other comorbidities like depression and, and confusion. You know, Lisa Crowen also, uh, uh, in addition to finding uh, elevated rates of Parkinson's, uh, found elevated rates of, of a lot of things, almost everything she looked at, uh, other uh, medical outcomes. Um, uh, this has been um, replicated by uh, others in the field who are also showing increased uh, uh, more, uh, mortality rates or lower, lower age mortality. Um, the idea that um, degenerative uh, changes, uh, degenerative uh, neurological uh, disorders uh, are associated with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders is not new. This is a, another a, a paper by Vivante from the uh, uh, Drexel group showing high rates of dementia and autism. We know about an association between Down syndrome and, and Alzheimer's, fragile X and tremor in later age. Um, and really, the question is that we, we have to begin to think about this in much more complex ways. Um, we have to be able to tease apart what things are specific what things are nonspecific, what things may be related to a single entity like a gene, what, what things are multifactorial, uh, and begin to think in much more complex ways about autism over the life course and medical outcomes. Now, you'll have to pardon me for using this slide. It's of a mouse study. I noticed there are no uh, basic science uh, studies uh, or, or presentations in this meeting. I happen to think that this is important for us to think about. Uh, it gives us a toehold into the biology, but the reason I include it is because it allows us to model the complexity of what's going on. And here is uh, uh, some evidence of increased Parkinson's disease risk related more directly to altered gene expression, uh, but more approximately to environmental changes. Uh, and it gives us insights into how we might begin to treat uh, this risk, and in ways that are maybe even more accessible uh, than altering uh, genetics uh, by thinking about changes that we can make uh, in the environment. Noticing I'm running out of time, so let me go kind of quickly. Um, finally, um, I think it was mentioned, uh, I think uh, Carl mentioned uh, in long-term care, we, we really just... Uh, don't know about autism. Our providers don't know about autism. They're untrained to take care of older people with autism um, at every level. Um, we have uh, nursing uh, uh, services that are used to uh, making multiple changes in the course of the shift and across the day. And they're not thinking that people, that autistic people have difficulty with uh, change. Uh, that's a very simple sort of surface level view of this but we need to begin to think about how we're gonna train the workforce to learn about autism uh, in our care facilities, um, our clinicians, our researchers, and begin to have programs like we do in, in geriatric medicine and geriatric psychiatry around the country. Every, 
every medical school in the country has a program in geriatric psychiatry and, and geriatric medicine. Finally, I'm gonna end by going back to the uh, recommendations that we made in the uh, meeting in Chapel Hill uh, 10 years ago uh, on the future. And there was an emphasis on the need for new screening tools in adults, thinking about diagnosis and assessment in a new way, um, moving past our focus uh, on children, both cross-sectional studies, because we can't wait for longitudinal studies, but also longitudinal studies um, need to be done to really sort out what's happening to individuals as they change over time. Um, we need uh, to focus on biology. Uh, the Parkinson's and dementia uh, data really just are hinting at something that's not just environmental, but there is uh, the bio biology at work. Uh, we don't know in which cases it is and in which cases it isn't. But autism is a heterogeneous condition and we need to keep that in mind. Uh, I think we're gonna hear a lot more today about services, uh, intervention, and hopefully long-term care. And of course, um, capacity uh, building through training and research and, and clinical practice.